All right. Next speaker is uh, Didi Bar Diane Barker, Didi Barker, followed by Richard Santos, followed by Rosie Lopez. Thank you, Mayor and Council, Didi Barker. I reside in Phoenix. And I've got three things I want to talk about, legal fees, cost cutting, and revenues. And I'm not taking a position on this. I don't need to be. I'm a citizen, and I want this city to move in prosperity peacefully forward. I'm talking about process. Now, first of all, legal fees. Is, is that we've got a Philadelphia firm, we've got a local Lubin, and I have read the documents on this, and uh, I believe after even listening today, our city attorney was talking about certain things we couldn't discuss here because we'd have to talk. No. Uh, what this whole thing needs to do is, is the court system is open, is, is that we need to have all of what you're talking about in the court present transparent in front of everybody. And the way you do that basically is through mediation, it needs to be transparent. And we don't need to have longer litigation. We also have Sherman Howard. I'm very familiar with an attorney for that. Uh, years ago got involved with that. I'm surprised the city of Phoenix would use them again. But my point of it is, is that we spend a lot in legal fees and we're giving P P uh, excuse me, the name Piccolio, 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 I think I have it there. It said, he's not a part of this litigation. That was what in the documents, they said, that's okay, we'll pay the 170,000 legal fees. I'm not saying that he, they don't deserve it, but the point of it is it goes on and on without a determination. The public is paying for this and we want it stopped. I can remember one thing Frank Fairbanks did with Brad, I think it was Wolford, is that he got a mediation between the Arizona contractors and they resolved it. It wasn't in court any longer. And the thing about it, we can't get into your salaries to sacrifice because you're in the city charter, is someday we need to have the public make a flexible of uh, not only salaries, but duties with our city council so that we can help solve all of these things. And finally, revenues, and I'll finish this. One thing the union did say, said, hey, you're talking about expenditures and you know, uh, you're not talking about a revenues and cutbacks in the employees. She, they referred it to she, she, the city, she, needs to be a leader and she needs to gather her followers and go forward in a good venture for revenues and that's what's missing. That is what's missing. All of the females on here brought up revenues and I don't see anything like that or any joint ventures where you're not really taxing the people but you're going out and creating something beautiful for the city of Phoenix. Thank you, Russians Barker. Uh, Richard. Uh Richard Santos is uh, next, Rosie Lopez afterwards, followed by Aaron Blake. Council members, my name is Richard Santos. I'm an industrial maintenance mechanic for the Water Services Department. In the recent weeks, I've been volunteering my time to go door to door and speak to other city employees and get their input about the current negotiations and what's going on. In speaking to all these employees, I realized that we have a wide variety of skilled labor in this city. We have guys that work on the automobiles, the auto mechanics that work on the police cars. They keep the police cars reliable so officers can get to their calls on time. Then we have the guys like myself, the mechanics that work and move water around this plant. Without what we do, the firefighters can't do their job. What, what is the reward for these people's hard work, for all the hard work we've been doing? Where's the reward? None of these guys were in acceptance and all the people that I spoke to, nobody was in acceptance to the contract. What we need to do is seek revenue sources to keep our infrastructure strong and keep the public safe.
Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Santos. I uh, appreciate that very much. <laughs> Rosie Lopez, uh, followed by Frankie Diaz. Mr. Blake, I realize you had donated your time to Louis Schmidt, who I think wants to finish at the end, so we'll donate at the end. Thank you. Good to see you. Mayor and Council, um, again, my name is Rosie Lopez, and I am here uh, to oppose uh, the city's uh, uh, proposal for AFSCME. And I am a retired AFSCME member, very proud of it. And I was also AFT when I was a teacher with AFL-CIO. Very proud member of the union. I am uh, really astounded that, uh, as always, the, the, bu the budget is always balanced off of the working people. Why? That doesn't make any sense to me. And I echo the sentiments that Jer uh, Reverend Jarrett Maupin, you know, expressed and others here on behalf of the unions, I really think that we ought to really respect our workers, and I don't think the city has done that yet. Uh, here you have you have not restored the 1.6, and now you're asking them to give to ha to have more cuts, to uh, to uh, put it on their backs. That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I agree with uh, someone who came earlier and said, you know, when you have a budget deficit you work within that budget deficit and you do not increase the budget. Uh, if you have to cut something, you, you really should be looking very seriously at, at uh, entertainment fees and all kinds of other fees that, that uh, are uh, sort of uh, luxurious. And I'm, I know that if you were creative enough, and I know you are, you could be, that you could find the money somewhere else and not with the unions. I really fear a lot of this stuff because I see it happening everywhere, including public education. It's always, you know, that the unions are the ones that are the monsters, and we have to get rid of them. We have to privatize. We have to do all of these things. And I, I, I ask you, I urge you, to to uh, re reject what uh, the city manager and whoever else has put together. And if you're part of it, to to. Uh, think again and work with the unions to make sure that they get what they need. They are the working people that make this economy go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lopez. Frankie Diaz followed by uh, Lawrence Hansen. Mayor, Council, City Manager, I thank you for this opportunity. I really heard from my brothers, the police officers, the fire, the blue collar workers. I mean, we work, we work our tail end off. A couple of, um, a couple of, excuse me, uh, about a year and a half. I got hit out there. I was jackhammering. I had all the protection that I needed. I got ha hit w from a, a truck on my uh, right leg. I don't mind working hard. What hurts, what hurts the most is you're, you're trying to take all this that what we what we deserve and what we've earned, we worked very hard. And I, I'm not here to argue with anyone. I'm not here to point fingers on anyone. I'm just here for all these people here. I mean, the police, they work so hard. They work, they're out there helping us. They're spotting us. Uh, they got families. All of us ha have children we want to come home to. Same with the fire. You know, what really hurts is that we can't seem to get things together. And all we got to do is is work together. I know we can do it. I just want to thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Diaz. Uh, next speaker will be Lawrence Hansen, followed by Marshall Pimentel, followed by uh, Joel DeFelice. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. Mr. Scherzer, welcome to the city. You've been here for a while, but now you got a big job. Um, my name is Larry Hansen. I work for the Water Services Department. You heard from um, one of my coworkers, Rich Santos. One of the things we do is we treat the water. Mr. Zercher identified that as a very important service that we provide. Rich Santos talked about that, talked about uh, how our members, the AFSCME members that we work with, take care of the cars, make sure that water is coming through the hydrants when it's needed. We're part of the infrastructure. We try to take care of the infrastructure best we can. We've been taking budget cuts, even though we're rev revenue producing, we're showing solidarity with other departments in the city. We've tried to spend our money wisely. We're starting to do more with less, and less is starting to be problematic. I sure that you all heard the proposal that Mr. Louis Schmidt had that our union voted on. You heard that our vote was 96% in favor of an alternative method to provide some cut, some balance to this budget. I respectfully request that you look at that carefully. We do provide needed service, clean drinking water, and treating that wastewater when it comes back to the wastewater plants. My customers are not only my coworkers from the job that I do, but they are the ratepayers of the city of Phoenix. When the city of Phoenix faced such a huge deficit in 2008, all the labor unions and employee associations sacrificed to save city jobs. We need to look for revenue. We need to be aware that if we bring a solution to the table, perhaps we can work together, try not to point fingers and call names, but to get this done, make it right. We can do it. We're turning the corner. It's not 277. It's 37. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, next speaker will be uh, Marshall Pimentel, Joel DeFelice, followed by Brian Malone. Mayor, City Council. I heard uh, Councilman DeCicio say $46 million more this year than last year. Um, that's true. But how much more have we spent this year than last year? Structural problems, bad economic plans, decisions. Let's start making decisions based on knowledge and not blame. We've been driving around, I work for traffic signals. We see cityscape, cityscape. We're putting up planners, we're putting up bike lanes. It's real easy to say that, hey, it's, let's put in a bike lane. But what we fail to realize is that there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into that bike lane, including timing changes, equipment for that. But do we put that into the budget? Do we just say, let's, let's put in a bike lane and we don't put into consideration all the other associated costs? I've seen downtown, we put planners right next to our traffic signal poles. We don't have access from a maintenance standpoint. It's a maintenance nightmare now. So we need new vehicles that we could get over there, double knuckle trucks, so we could get over these things. They're gonna be big trees one day and we're gonna be taking care of those to trim them back. It doesn't make sense. So we don't look at all those different things and when we bring it up, we're, we're the guys out in the field. We bring those things up during meetings. We're semi-professionals, we're tech, technicians, we're technical. And we bring this stuff up and it goes on deaf ears. Sometimes it never gets passed. I had a talk with uh, one of the engineers from TMC and found out that, hey, we're, we're bringing this stuff up, but they're never told. So there's a lot of communication problems that I think are adding to this problem of, you know, losing money because of bad decisions. So please listen to the guys that are out in, in the field and, and listen to our decisions. We used to get these Phoenix Awards and we've saved money but there's a lot of times when we've come up with good ways of, of saving money. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marshall. 
Oh, if you could, if, uh, gentlemen. Council of did you have a question uh, for Mr. Pimentel? Yeah, or just a comment too. Yeah, the 46 million is what's more this year than the, than the previous year. And I also mentioned too that this is the second highest budget year, at least from what I can remember, at least from the records. But you, sh you know, the real question comes down to whether or not you and other employees and even the citizens of Phoenix should be responsible for the mismanagement of the city of Phoenix. And when you're talking about deaf ears, I get it because I believe that a lot of good ideas have gone on deaf ears here. Um, here's the, the real problem, and I'm gonna lay it out for you too. The city of Phoenix, for the first time ever, got a credit downgrade on its bond. A, a credit downgrade. Sure. It just, maybe it was small, but it was the first time that ever happened. And the city of Phoenix has always respected its credit downgrade. I'm gonna tell you right here and now, because of the mismanagement of the property tax, that's the next big crisis to happen. Mm -hmm. That's gonna have an impact on all of you and you should be demanding that the city fix it. Others should be demanding that they fix it. But that credit, the property tax mismanagement, I believe by the end of this year is gonna create another credit downgrade at the city of Phoenix. And there are a few of us up here that aren't gonna be voting for property tax increases because of the mismanagement that occurred. It's because it, it started to occur. And management and the politicians, everybody allowed that to happen, that mismanagement of the property tax. That's the next big crisis, folks. And guess who's gonna have to pay for it? You're gonna start seeing it in your wages, you're gonna start seeing your compensation, you're gonna see it in other things too. It's part of the structural deficit that I've talked about. So the question is whether or not the city is going to be able to do some basic things to fix the structural deficit and to fix the problem here. I just don't see it happening right now. Um, there are, all you need is five votes to fix it. It's not that complicated, but it requires everyone sitting down. Um, I think Mr. Pacioli, actually had a, an, an interesting idea that dealt with for, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 911 charging other cities mm -hmm. made sense to me. We need to look into that too. There's probably two to three million dollars there. So there are reasonable ways to make it work and to fix it. Uh, one of the other ways, I mean, right off the bat, I've asked staff to cut those 104 vacant positions that probably represent, and I'm just guessing, I don't know this number to be exact because I'm waiting for a number from staff, but that could be eight or nine million dollars right off the bat. And the fact of the matter is, it is not 277 million like it was in 2010, it's 37.7 million that is the problem that needs to be fixed. And I think that there are reasonable ways to fix it. Um, I don't think I could get five votes to do what I would like to have done, but I think there are reasonable ways to fix it like I outlined earlier. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I think that there is a way to make it work without having to stick with this budget. I think this budget creates an even more of an economic problem for the city. Thank you. All right, thank, I think very much, Mr. Pimentel. Did you have a chance to, it wasn't really an informal question. I guess it was a uh, statement. I guess my reply request is if we're gonna keep uh, speakers up there that we ask them questions, otherwise let them sit down. But do you have a response? If I can, to just real quick. Sure. Um, reasonable ways, you know, the food tax. Everybody doesn't like the food tax. Every city, on average around us pays a 2%, on average 2%. We reduced ours by one. We can generate revenue that way. In fact, I don't know, I've sat at some of the other meetings and I've heard the public say, we would like to pay for that. If we have to keep our parks open, if we have to keep our potholes fixed, if we have to keep traffic signals working, fire department staff, Phoenix staff, everybody staff, we want that and we'll pay for it gladly, let's pay our fair share. We've heard that, food tax. The other thing is contracting. We contract a lot of things out, why? We are a nonprofit organization. We tend to contract a lot of things out when we have the infrastructure. We should not be doing that. You cannot tell us that contracting these things out makes sense when you're giving it to a for-profit organization to make money off of us and bind the city into a contract that doesn't give the city taxpayers the votes or any way or any recourse to be able to stop bad decisions. When we're on the streets, they take pictures of us. They have accountability. We have uh, to be accountable to all of you, including the city of Phoenix. But when you have contractors out there, they don't know who's doing that stuff. So that's just a bad way of doing things. And, and I just don't see why we do that when we have the infrastructure in place. We should not be contracting our jobs out, not from a nonprofit to a for-profit. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, I did, uh, <laughs> city manager representatives at a previous hearing, but I did want to have him at least have address the issue of uh, 
cost savings uh, for elimination of positions in our proposed city budget. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the vacancy issue we've discussed before, we have eliminated several vacancies as part of our efficiency uh, reduction. There's another uh, uh, several hundred vacancies which are already accounted for in the budget in something called salary savings. So cutting those does not uh, lower the budget deficit. Then there are uh, about 100 plus vacancies that are already proposed as service reductions. Um, you know, for example, in unit one, uh, because I've worked with uh, Mr. Higgins closely on this, we have several vacancies in our street transportation department, which the employees there desperately need to have filled so that they have full crews. And so those represent uh, positions that we need to provide the level of service that we are, um, we are budgeted for. Then there are probably about 100 positions that are not recommended for cut because they represent the kind of services that we need to fill the positions for and do. So th there's a minimal amount of, uh, of savings that can actually be taken at the end once you account for all of our vacancies in the general fund. Uh, Mayor, may I do a follow-up call uh, request? You, you may, of course. Uh, Ed, what's the value of those 104 vacant positions? I still haven't gotten a number on that. Yeah, the vacant positions that are not represented already through vacancies, through salary savings, or through services that were recommended uh, for elimination in the trial budget would be about six and a half million dollars. However, we believe that those positions are important to provide the services that we need. And if we would cut those, we would have to lower the level of service that we say we're gonna provide to the community. Well, what, what if we did this? Uh, one, is that a total compensation number or is that just a salary number, the 6.5 million? That's the budgeted number for those positions of compensation. So that would be total compensation, everything included. Can we get a list of all those positions, um, how long they've been vacant? Okay, and so that we can see the prioritization of that. I could imagine maybe one or two of those are something we could look at, but let's take a look at what those 104 are and how long they've been vacant. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, okay, Councilwoman Gallego, do you have a question or comment? I just wanted to weigh in on that item as well. Thank um, you. I think we have a lot of vacancies that are very vital positions, some in maintenance, as we alluded to. Other positions include our city's volunteer programs administrator, which is currently vacant. But if we were to cut that position, I think we would see deep cuts elsewhere because volunteers provide such vital services to our community. And so these things would, just because they're vacant doesn't mean they're the, the easy things to cut. They will be very, very expensive and very complicated. In many cases, they're vacant because our employees went elsewhere because what they did was so vital and sought after by the private sector or other municipalities. So from my perspective, that is not an easy solution to this very, very difficult budget. All right, oh, no, thank you very much. I appreciate that. We got, we're going to stay on track here relative to uh, uh, the issues presented by management and, our, and uh, by uh, our employee group leaders relative to the proposed uh, labor negotiations. But there was information provided by Council of the about a cost savings. It's important to note that city management is recommending a significant number of position eliminations in this budget, but there are some that he's just not proposing that we uh, eliminate because of this, the, the core services uh, that would be needed. And then the cost savings by eliminating all of them would be, I guess, about $6 million is, the, uh, is what the uh, budget amount is. Okay, Joel, Joel Dupo. Oh, Councilman Pastor, please. I would like to see not only the how long the vacancies or how long it's been vacant, I'd also like to know the if there's a ranking of importance of how vital it is, because there's a possibility that we could look at reorging or doing a reorganization of responsibilities. Uh, I just think we really need to uh, start looking uh, all over the place on how we get to, the, to where we need to get to. Uh, as a service employee myself, and uh, going through this experience right now, uh, I understand and I get it. And uh, sometimes we, we forget things where we could do some some creative ideas, so and I Mayor, would like to see that. There's a follow-up too. Councilman, to see if you have a short um, follow-up and then we'll Yeah, on the request to, as you rank order, the 104 from top to bottom, if you could also, uh, and put in there how long they've been vacant, but also, it, it just seems more logical to me to cut a vacant position than a filled position. It just seems logical that's the first place you would start. Um, and that's kind of what I'd like to look. So as you're doing the rank order down from top to bottom, most important to least, is that okay with you? Or yeah. most least important to, to most, however you want to do it. Um, but also put in there, 
the value of that. And if I could get in writing too what the total true cost, total compensation is for those vacant positions, you know, I don't know if that's the right amount because that would show you a, a total compensation number of around $65,000 per person when we already know that the uh, LIUNA contract is right around 68,000 on average compensation. So I don't, you know, I don't know how it gets much lower than LIUNA when they're the lowest paid, but I don't know if those are all the lowest levels we have in the city of Phoenix. That's what that would tell me. So I'd like to get an idea what those are and how they're ranked, total compensation, and then I can compare it to the LIUNA contract, which is right around 68,000 per person. Thanks. Please. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Ma Councilman Zizio, and Councilman Pastor. I just want to set expectations here because we have a limited number of staff members in and we are in the middle of budget. This is not a, a quick and easy thing to come up with. So it's not going to be instantaneous that we do it, but we will do that. And we do a yearly reorganization effort every summer with departments. And the first thing we do is we do go through vacancies to check that. Um, so I just want to. But, but I've been asking for this for like a long time now, too. Like, what are they? Where the cut? I mean, it just seems logical to me that that's where you start the cuts. That's where it is. The ones that it represent. And I just am doubting. Not that you know, no one's telling me the exact number right now, so it's not on your end of it, Ed. But when you've got Lyon at sixty-eight thousand per person, and we're being told that these are critical jobs, um, I don't know how you don't. And they're at sixty-eight thousand, and how we got at sixty-five thousand. Actually, a little less than sixty-five thousand per person here. I'd like to get that idea. I don't get it. It doesn't. It's not logical right now. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so, if you could get information to Councilman about the vacant uh, positions uh, and the, how we're getting the cost estimates, Councilman, please. Will this project take more than eight hours in your estimate, City Manager? Uh, well, there's several layers of this. So, we I think we've provided to the council before last month a l comprehensive list of all of our vacancies. That does not take more than eight hours. But if the council truly wants to get some sort of rank ordering of vacancies, that is a that is a big effort that really goes to the council's prioritization. So that part of it, I think, is problematic. But a list of vacancies with the how long they've been vacant, that is not an eight-hour issue. Yeah, that's and that, if I make clear, that's what I was suggesting that uh, if it hasn't been provided to uh, the council, uh, provide the information. Rank order is a whole different. Uh, okay, uh, so order. then let's let's look at it this way. Can you go back to each manager or director and ask them at these positions, which ones would you be able to, uh, how would you want to hire? Mayor Councilman Pastor, that is actually how the budget is put together. The trial budget gets put together and that is a significant part of that okay. uh, effort. But with these positions, can we go back to those managers and say, these positions, these three positions are up, which ones would you save? If that is the desire of the council, I do think that is more than an eight hour project for staff. But if, that, if, if the council, we have hundreds and hundreds of vacancies and they switch every day. They, they add and subtract every day. So I mean, it, this is, this, it's a significant effort. Not, not, not showing you what the, at what the vacancies are or how long they've been there, but getting into prioritization and listing and those sorts of things, that is a significant effort. We do that in the summer regularly with departments, Ed, but to do that now is a, is okay. a bigger effort. We can, we can discuss this later. Sure. But as a director and me having open or vacant positions and management comes to me and says, you have these vacant positions, which ones are you willing to sacrifice? All you say, check this one. I just find it hard to know that it's going to take more than a half hour to an hour. Multiplied across 26 departments, but I think the bigger issue is each position represents services to the community, and so that, that gets to, my point is the council makes those decisions, and so that's a bigger effort that we need to do collaboratively with the council. But getting, getting the list of vacancies, that is not a hard thing to do. And Mayor, as a follow-up too. Councilman Cecil, please. Ed, if it really represents six and a half million dollars, I mean, I know there are a few of us up here that really want us to dig into that, and whether it's the 
you know, I, I would think that the labor organizations would like it, and I think the public would like it, but I don't think it's that much of a lift to ask which ones are important, which ones aren't, so we as a council could maybe chop off two or three million dollars, or a million, I don't know. It just becomes that much more to the revenue mix. Now, I, I don't know what the hesitancy to cut these are. I mean, you've done a good job of getting information, but I have literally asked for this for weeks on end to, to find out what these 104 are, what they represent. I'm seriously having concerns about whether or not they're really worth the, the 65,000 per person, if they're really that, value, that highly needed, you know, what they are. It just doesn't make logical sense to me when we've got the least, um, the lowest number here at 68,000, and how does it not get higher than that? So I, I, you know, and I know you don't have all the information right now, but it is something that I think a few of us would really like to have done and looked at and have be part of the budget. And it just makes sense to at least the labor to have the vacant positions cut. Why would they want a, a real life person cut when they can get a vacant position? It just would not make sense to me. Thanks. I think, uh, thank you very much. To be clear, we're not talking about cutting any positions in which people are currently filled in the city as part of any budget uh, discussions. Are, we, are you talking about laying people off? No. Oh. Joel DeFelice is uh, the next uh, speaker. And then uh, Brian Malone is after that. Followed by Mr. John Rusnick. Thank you, Council. Thank you for believing my dad. <laughs> uh, just like to start off, um, I'm a single father. I'm a city uh, of Phoenix employee, about a year and a half now. You know, there's something that I've, uh, that I've already given my son. And that's a father. That's something I never had. And there's something else I wanna give him. I wanna give him the opportunity for a higher education that's something I never even thought about growing up in a household with a mother who raised me at the age of 16 years old. It wasn't until I was 28 years old till I got my GED for him to do the right thing and go to college. I cannot believe that I'm sitting up here fighting for something that's gonna affect my son's future. You know, every year I try to put as much as I can in. And if this cut goes through, he might end up doing the same thing as I did. It is imperative that we think about the future and we take responsibility for looking at sustainable ideas to generate revenue for the city. It is unacceptable to look us in the eye and say, we're gonna cut you guys again. There's plenty of reasons to get this on board. And I still believe in my leaders that they're gonna do the right thing. You know, we all talk about doing the right thing. It's time to do the right thing. Um, I believe we all deserve a raise, you know? We got 500 police officers that are doing more. We have over 300 unit employees doing more. I wear many hats at work and I'm proud to go above and beyond. But when you just keep on digging us down and digging us down, when I started it was pension reform. I started October of 2012. I fr first came into pension reform, then I came into vacation, a sick leave snapshot. Then I came into biometrics, uh, uh, not a snapshot, but uh, an overlook of, of that. Now we're facing possibly a vacation snapshot again. I wanna spend time with my son and standing up here fighting for what, I, what, I, what we need, I'm losing time. 
and I say to Council, please take in consideration that your decisions don't affect just 1.6 percent of an overall base wage and, and vacation salary and so on, but it affects guys like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brian Malone is next, followed by uh, Mr. Rusnick, John Rusnick. Oh. oh, okay, thanks. So, John, you'll be next. Hello, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Brian Malone. I'm uh, uh, with the City of Phoenix Aviation Department. And um, I came with the, to the city years and years ago for uh, the job stability and, and was a, a decent wage and a, and a good retirement package. And um, uh, I just want to regress that I, I am at, uh, in the aviation department and uh, uh, Deer Valley Airport is the number one general aviation airport in the U.S. and in the world. And uh, Deer, uh, Deer Valley Airport and Sky Harbor both are in the top 20 in the listing of and last time I checked, the aviation uh, uh, operations for you know the ranking in the in the in the in the U.S. and in the world, and um, we uh, recently have uh, filled four positions that were over the last several years were vacant, and, um, and these new employees are saying they come up to me and they say they were so happy that they finally got their dream job, and uh, I'm. I'm happy for them, but in the meantime, I see some of the scenarios that we've had to uh, go through in the last contracts, the uh, last several contracts with the union, uh, between the union and the city, and I know times are tough, but I'm no accountant, and, uh, and there's things that are, that are hard to do, and um, sometimes they have to be done, but in this case, I, I think uh, others have mentioned, prior to me speaking, that you're, you're cutting to the bone. And, um, and getting back to these new employees, they're, they're sharing with me that uh, it's their dream job, and, I, and I, I, I smile at them, and I shake their hand, and I said, well, uh, you know, I think I could tell them was good luck with that. And I, I, I hope that uh, they do have a good future, and, and uh, you know, there's happier times ahead. I just wanted to sh give, give a voice to, to uh, one of the people that are uh, under this budget cut. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Malone. The next speaker will be Mr. Uh, John uh, Rusnick, up to two minutes. My name is John Rusnick. I want to go to on a little different route than what everybody was. Everybody seems, and every, it's rightful, everybody wants to get as much as they can get. Now, I worked for Salt River Project for 35 years. Uh, I started digging ditches, and then I worked my way up to a maintenance supervisor in a power plant. So we have a different, all kinds of jobs that these people work here. They, they're electricians, they're mechanics, they're everything. But who is going to get hurt the most? Uh, the anointed ones get their raises. There's no money, we're in, a, we're in a hole. The union wants to get as much as they can get, and I was a union man, I was in local 266, electrical workers. I was on safety committees, and I was also on a negotiating committee. The thing is that people are gonna have to come and get together. The man came up here with his little child, but. What about the 1.6 million people and their children? So you guys are going to have to get together and come up with something that's not going to take away from the seniors. They had the budget meeting. Our, our manager was there. Sal DeCecil was there. There's all these people in this senior center down there waiting to get lunch, and there's not one of them in that group that probably makes $30,000 a 
of retirement a year. Thanks, John. We appreciate it. Uh, next up is Dr. Michael Pierce, followed by Aaron Blake. Good afternoon. Winston Churchill observed, before the Second World War hit the world, that they that will not, when they may, when they would, they shall have nay. And this is where we are today again. I guess history is something that we don't really learn from. We neither forget it nor learn from it. Now, the words that I can say probably won't feel a thimble compared to that father and his son who so simply and eloquently said it. Working people and the laborers in these city government, they just don't take, they give, and they work hard. I'm a member of Local 383 of the uh, Laborers International Union. I know what it's like to work. They have dreams for their family, and they've invested not just their work, but their families and their lives. They're part of this city, too. Now, I'm going to be making sure that you're all on good behavior for the next coming months, because you're going to have big temptation to want to spin like a drunken sailor for the Super Bowl. And you'll find millions then, when you can have a big party for the wealthy interests. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to set an example, and you're going <clears> to <throat> make a solution that is honorable and just and rises to the best expectations that families have for themselves. And working families here know how to balance a budget. They have to. Their survival's on the line. And you people on the council and in the administration of this city had best learn and learn quick. The framers of our Declaration of Independence knew about human nature. Thomas Jefferson wrote really eloquently in the Declaration of Independence when he said, mankind is more disposed to suffer evil while it is sufferable than to change the very forms to which they have been accustomed. Learn from history or you'll be on the other side of it. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pierce. <laughs> Next speaker is Antoinette Arredondo. Ms. Arredondo, if you wish to testify. My name is Matthew, and this is my mom, Antonia Arredondo. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mayor, and City of Council. I am proud and dedicated of the City of Phoenix employee. I have worked. Uh, Mayor and, and City Council, my name is Antoinette Arredondo. I am a proud and dedicated City of Phoenix employee. I have worked for the city of Phoenix for 11 years. I have never addressed city council or ever felt I had to until now. City employees been labeled greedily
lazy and overpaid. Sadly, some of these uh, some of uh, some of these some attacks come from a few of our own council. The fighting and lack of leadership from our council has moved me to address you today. As a single mother raising a family and living in Phoenix, my children My children re rely on me as sole provider. I am here today on behalf of my children, my Phoenix family of coworkers, and my community. You may consider me You may consider me just a beggar number. I am proud mother and I worry and realize what this financial impact will do to me and my family. Your decision alone regarding this contract is overwhelming and stressful. The budget cuts will mean I, I must sacrifice more and work harder due to unfilled positions while receiving less pay to provide for my family. All city employees are dedicated to Phoenix and the community. <clears throat> All city employees are back are the backbone of this state uh, organization which and watch and listen to the community budget meaning you will hear the same statement over and over restore the food tax we as citizens understand the importance of services and programs and ask that the food tax be restored to fund these vital services and programs. Listen to the people. The people say, People say, restore the food tax for the good of Phoenix. 
Mary Station, you may say no to the food tax. I am willing to pay, but I have not seen any new ideas from you on resolving this deflect. If you may not remember my face or what was said. after today, but I'm okay. With that, I leave here today. with loyalty and pride for my community, knowing I did all I can. I have just one simple request. Consider your vote next week will have on my children's future.
don't take the easy way out and balance this defect on my family's back because I ask, restore the food tax. If your vote is to balance this defect on city employees, I ask, will you buy my medication? Will you pay my co-payment when I have to go see the doctor? Or better yet, will you buy food to feed my children when I can't afford to because of these cuts? Remember that we as city employees work very hard to make Phoenix beautiful and a better place to live for our children. Please be honorable and do right by the employees. Restore the food tax. Thank you for listening.